Welcome to the Voluntary Virtues Radio Network. This is your host, Andrew Krishan, and this is Scholarly Sedition. Today, we will be talking about the difference between anarcho-capitalism and anarcho-socialism, a topic which is often brought up a lot, but which I really, I really think doesn't get into the, the nitty-gritty, the real theory, the different varieties of anarcho-socialism, and even anarcho-capitalism for that matter. Um, and <clears throat> which of these, I think, is, uh, is in line with the non-aggression principle? Which of these, I think, determines the label libertarianism? Do they all deserve this lab- label libertarianism? Are they all in line with the non-aggression principle? Um, you know, is neither anarcho-socialism nor anarcho-capitalism a good, a good term to use? Roderick Long of the Mises Institute has made this claim. He claims that... Uh, capitalism and socialism are are fake concepts like um, you know like a square circle. Uh, they're they're just nonsensical, ill-defined terms that that don't make sense. And he he has a long argument on that, uh, which I disagree with. I think there's a very a very real difference between capitalism and socialism. Um, so what what is capitalism? What is anarcho-capitalism? Well, capitalism. Uh, if we want to go by a good dictionary definition that is widely accepted and uh, you know you can kind of define words however you want right like liberal has changed meaning uh, libertarian used to mean communist you know 150 years ago and now it doesn't uh, so it's important if we're going to attach ourselves to a word like capitalism and, and define a philosophy we agree with like anarcho-capitalism we really need to define capitalism and uh, it'd be helpful if we could define it in a way that most people agree with, because in order to discuss with someone, you need to be using the same the same definitions, or or you're talking past each other. You're you're speaking different languages but using the same words. So capitalism, I think, is best defined as private ownership of the means of production. And uh, so what would socialism be then? Um, socialism is generally understood as social ownership of the means of production. This is a common definition. Uh, you know, I, I'm willing to throw my weight fully behind the common definition of capitalism, private ownership of the means of production. I don't even know if I agree with this common definition of socialism because social is such a weird you know, concept. Uh, how is social... What is social ownership of the means of production mean and uh, so there's two varieties of socialism there's state socialism and there's anarcho-socialism these are are two main different ways to break it up into Um, most things fall into either one of these categories Uh, and in anarcho-socialism there's a few different uh, blends of thought there's anarcho-capitalism there's anarcho-syndicalism there's mutualism and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about each of these later uh, but anarcho-socialism, social ownership of the means of production, uh, what this really means, what, what the real difference, uh, if you do a lot of, if you read a lot of these authors, and I have read a lot of these authors uh, from the anarcho-socialist sphere, um, social ownership of the means of production means occupancy and use property rights. Occupancy and use property rights means that uh, whoever's occupying and using a, a thing owns it. And um, kind of the, there's different degrees of this, right? It's kind of uh, an unfair straw man, even though I think it's logically consistent with occupancy and use to say something like, um, oh, you could never lend a car to a friend because they could just take off with it uh, and you'd have no recourse. Uh, most occupancy and use people don't support this. What they're talking about is in an occupancy and use society, in an, in an anarcho socialist society, Although, you know, you can have occupancy and use enforced by a state as well. In fact, I think that's the only way it would really come about to be widespread. Uh, But, you know, in the anarcho-socialist conception, uh, there's no state, and the means of production are divided according to occupancy and use. Uh, It's not private ownership of the means of production in the sense of private consumer property, such as a, a car... Uh, can be you know shared and you know given to someone and and parked without someone else stealing it and them being now the occupier and user. So the anarcho socialists make this distinction really between uh, consumption goods, which are are private in their conception, 
um, with with a few. Uh, there might be a few crazy anarcho-socialists who really don't even believe cons any consumer goods should be private, um, but most of them do. But the difference is uh, production goods, means of production. Uh, pretty much, they're not privately owned. In that, if you privately own something, if you own um, a guitar, you could um, lease it to someone else, right? You could uh, lend it to a friend, and this this is a contract, right? Here, I'll lend you my guitar if you get it back to me Thursday. And this contract, you know, you, you two are really free to arrive at any voluntary contract you want. Uh, the whole concept of contract rights implies this, right? If we have contract rights, then I can do away with my private property. I can exchange it with someone else. Uh, I can lease it out to someone else. Uh, and if they sign a contract with me, uh, we both are bound by the terms of this contract. And if one of us breaks the terms of this contract, it's a violation of, of the non-aggression principle. It's a violation of one of our liberties is how the anarcho-capitalist viewpoint would be the private, the capitalist viewpoint, the private ownership of the means of production. And the social ownership of the means of production, anarcho-socialism would say, um, no, you're, you're stealing. Uh, so if I le lend my car to someone in exchange for $100, uh, that 100 bucks is theft, right? Uh, I'm stealing it. Uh, if I have a piece of land and I tell someone else, hey, I'll I'll give you this this piece of land, my farm. I'll, I'll let you use it for five years in exchange for this much money. Um, you know, according to the kind of Proudhon's argument, uh, who's really one of the, the first anarcho-socialists, the first person to call himself an anarchist, in fact, uh, really talked about how if you, um, in any trade that's meaningful, uh, both parties give up something. But you know, a, a person who owns a piece of land. Uh, and someone who farms it, uh, what's the person who owns the piece of land giving up? No, the farmer, you know, who has to pay his sharecropping fees is giving fees to that landowner, and the landowner is giving up nothing. This is Proudhon's conception. And uh, Bastiat and Proudhon got in a big debate over this, and Bastiat was not an anarcho-capitalist. He was more of a minarchist, but he was, he was very close, and his theories really were one and the same as the common non-aggression principle adhered to by most anarcho, well, really all anarcho-capitalists, whether they're consequentialists or deontological, they just kind of agree that private property and, uh, you know, non-state invasion of private property, at least, is a, is a good thing. So Bastiat's uh, big critique of Proudhon's argument that, you know, this, this person who owns the land uh, is stealing from the sharecropper by taking his rent, uh, the, the lender who lends someone money is stealing by charging interest. Uh, or even by uh, taking the money back and demanding the original amount be repaid. Uh, these are kind of two different variants of anarcho-socialism. Benjamin Tucker was a uh, individualist anarchist, a socialist who, from the um, 19th century, who thought that you should return the original capital, just not you know anything beyond that. So the the sharecropper should give back his land, but just not pay any rent. He doesn't owe any rent. You know the um, the person who takes out a loan, he has to give the original amount back, but he's not obligated to give back more interest. So this is kind of a soft variety of anarcho-socialism, but in either one of these uh, varieties, it ignores opportunity cost, right? So uh, the person who rents out his land to the sharecropper, you know, he is giving something up, and he's giving up, you know, what he could have otherwise done with the land, right? Maybe he could have sold the land, uh, which the, the anarcho-socialists have no problem with selling things out, right? So it's kind of funny that you know, they ignore this fact that the person who's renting the land out, he could have just sold it. Um, why didn't he? Uh, well, and why didn't the person who's renting the land just buy it? Well, obviously, the person who's renting the land did not want to buy it, or they would have bought it in any system that allows both of these. And the person who sold, who's uh, renting out the land, the rentier didn't want to sell it to this person, or the person didn't make him an offer he found acceptable. So, you know, the, the market just works out in these absentee property relations. Uh, for instance, if I, say, own a building and I want to rent out a bunch of rooms, um, I'm giving up what I otherwise could have done with that building. If I lend someone $100 and charge them 10 bucks interest, uh, I'm giving up 
you know, what I could have done with that hundred dollars in the meantime. Um, maybe I could have invested it in another project that I would have made five dollars interest in. So it's not like I'm giving up nothing if I charge rent, interest, or uh, profit is really just rent on capital. You can think of it, uh, you know, a person owns a bunch of machinery and he rents it out to someone. Uh, this is really the same contract with slightly different language than if a person owns a bunch of machinery and he hires someone, right? He's, uh, you know, the rental, a rental contract can say anything. Maybe I'll rent it to you for a fixed amount, maybe a variable amount, maybe the variable amount is that um, you, you know, have to return all the proceeds of that product except for a fixed amount, and that could be uh, your wage, which is the typical wage arrangement. And, uh, you know, these are all just exchanges, voluntary contracts made that are not allowed is really the only word for it in anarcho-socialism. In that, uh, as Benjamin Tucker, the anarcho-socialist, said, uh, his conception of liberty is anarcho-socialism. Uh, liberty abolishes uh, profit. It abolishes uh, monopolistic rent, which he kind of defined to mean all rent. Uh, but, you know, it abolishes profit pretty much is the main, you know, the main gist of it. And, uh, Profit, interest, rent, these are all kind of different varieties of the same thing. It just depends whether you're lending out you know, a piece of land, an apartment, whether you're lending out uh, money, whether you're lending out machinery, and then the price you're, you're taking back from this. Um, whether you're allowing someone else access to your machinery for a price, um, whether you know, you're allowing someone to use your machinery and um, you're paying them. This is another just form of renting out uh, your machinery, and it's it's all based on the contract, right? You can do with your machinery whatever you, you want to, however, you, whatever you please in an anarcho-capitalism, because there's private ownership of the means of production, and private property can be disposed as you wish. Now, in anarcho-socialism, there's social ownership of the means of production, there's occupancy and use property rights, and so the, the means of production aren't really owned by anyone, and Proudhon goes into this whole, uh, you know, property is a fiction in his mind, in his anarcho-socialist mind conception, because no one, you know, can own a, a sewing machine, because they're they're not, a, you know, if you really owned something, you could do what you want with it, but in, uh, in Proudhon's world, you're not allowed to own a sewing machine and, you know, hire a wage laborer to work it, or um, you know, Etc. Etc. And I think this just uh, completely is a nonsensical philosophy, and it, it really breaks down with things like, um, you know, I own a restaurant and I hire a plumber to come and fix the pipes. Uh, is, is this evil somehow? Um, you know, how how is it different if I hire a restaurant and I hire a waitress? I, I think most occupancy and use people have to kind of admit that a restaurant can hire a plumber, right? Um, should the plumber then have partial ownership of the restaurant as a co-owner, as kind of this democratic means of production? You know, democracy is really what occupancy and use ownership means. Is, uh, if there's a hundred people working at a firm, there's a there's democracy there, and they all get their input. It's a little fuzzy as to how this actually means. Um, also, the consumers uh, don't really get a say in this, although there's some kind of more modern anarcho-socialists who alter the theory a little uh, to say that, hey, the consumers should have some power too, or all the power, um, but hey, you know, either the consumers have the power, the, uh, the workers have the power, or the people who actually own the means of production um, can dispose of it how they want. And, you know, so absentee property is the alternative to occupancy and use property. This is the ability to own something that you are not occupying and using, um, and specifically economic arrangements such as rent, profit, interest, and, um, you know, these things are all, they're all absentee relations. And if absentee property is done away with, then you don't have these. So... One of the the main critiques I have on, of anarcho-socialism is, is on economics ground, and it involves the economic calculation problem. So the economic calculation problem, which is uh, admitted by 
some of the anarcho-socialists who think money should exist. There, this, it kind of depends on how crazy you want to get with this anarcho-socialism thing. Uh, the anarcho-communists typically don't even think money will exist without the state. Uh, some of the mutualists, which is another form of anarcho-socialism, the mutualists uh, think that, yeah, sure, money, money will exist, like Kevin Carson and Roderick Long. They admit the economic calculation problem, but they don't really fully apply it. Um, and so let me just go over the economic calculation problem. This, is, uh, this comes from the Austrian School of Economics. And it's you know, the reason why central planning doesn't work. Because uh, central planning, it doesn't work for a variety of reasons, but the first and foremost is that it can't calculate. Um, and what, uh, what does this mean? So you, know, you can't add up an apple and an orange. You can't add up an hour of labor with 100 tons of steel. What you can do is add up their prices, right? You can add up the price of an apple and an orange. Uh, you, need, you, know, you need to be able to add and subtract things to use math to calculate, to figure out you know, how do I make this good more efficient? Is there another material that does the same job that's cheaper? These things are all uh, essential. You need to be able to do the, these mathematics to figure out how to optimize your product, right? Uh, wh which uh, formula, you know, re which recipe for your product uh, costs the less and returns the most. You know, you want to, to profit. And, um, you know, every, every occupancy and use business is concerned with profit, although many anarcho-socialists denounce it, right? I mean, everyone's concerned with profit, right? You, uh, just kind of by virtue of human action, you act, you use men means to achieve ends, and your ends might be uh, the well-being of another, but th those are your ends. That's your profit. So your profit could be the well-being of another. It could be your your own self. But firms that act to uh, maximize profit are firms that produce things. Uh, you know, maximize production is another word for it. Maximize uh, production that is valuable. Valuable production. You know, so a firm. You know, if it makes uh, a laptop that's twice as fast. You know, this is a better product. Um, and in a socialist or centrally planned society, a complete centrally planned society, not, not in a narco-socialist society, which I will treat in a minute, but for now, the centrally planned society does not have this calculation mechanism um, because it does not have prices. Prices are exchange ratios in transactions, transactions being uh, mutually agreed to um, exchanges. And this means that people have to have things they're exchanging, right? Um, you can't exchange anything if you don't own anything. You can't exchange any physical object, at least. Um, and so if there's no exchange, if there's no ownership besides a, a grand ownership by the state, then there's no prices, and you can't, you can't do math and figure out how to make things. Uh, it, it's, it means there couldn't even be, you know, it's not like a computer is unfeasible in a socialist country. The, the socialists, the fully socialist countries that do exist today, like North Korea, um, you know, they, they are able to get a, a, some primitive technology, a few of them develop nukes, but uh, they're able to kind of uh, free ride off the capitalist countries, right? Um, you know, they don't really produce much themselves. Uh, they imitate the prices in the capitalist country to figure out what things are really worth because they wouldn't otherwise know. The Communist Party of, of China, for instance, uh, during full communism in China, would, would always be looking at the Sears Roebuck catalog to figure out what things cost in relation to each other. You know, is a hammer, you know, 100 times more than a male, nail? Is it 50 times more than a nail? Because they have no way of figuring out this out internally. They run into the calculation problem. So this is socialism. How does it apply to anarcho-socialism? Well, anarcho-socialism faces the, the very same calculation problem. Uh, for now, I will deal with mutualism. Anarcho-syndicalism and anarcho-communism, uh, two other varieties of anarcho-socialism, I'll deal with in a bit. Um, but for now, I'll, I'll tackle mutualism, which is occupancy and use, uh, you know, no state. There's still money, of course. But... Um, there's no rent, right? You can't rent out land. You can't rent out labor. You can't rent out machinery. Uh, you can't rent out money. There's no interest. There's no profit. There's no rent. And so uh, because everything is occupancy and use, there's no absentee uh, property. There's no contracts made. And so there's no exchange ratios in these contracts. Uh, there's no contracts made for means of production. And so 
the anarcho-socialist and mutualist economy can't really calculate because it doesn't have these prices. How much is a laborer worth? You know, uh, is a laborer producing uh, as much as he could if he works in one industry during the summer and another in the winter? Um, you know, what if he owns the capital in the first? In the summer, he works at a hot dog stand he owns, and in the winter, he works at a, a factory he doesn't own. Uh, maybe this is you know how to maximize his income. But you you have to own the means of production to to be in a mutualist society. You know you have to have this democratic ownership. So there's no there's no you know wage labor going on. You don't know how much a person is worth, how much his wage is worth. If a firm decides to take on another person, they that person now owns much of the firm. So you know if two people run a hot dog stand, they're thinking about hiring on a third person. Uh, they can't calculate. Uh, based on just the, oh, we'll have them work five hours and pay them for those five hours. They have to say, okay, we're going to give them an equal share of the profits and we're going to hire him on and he will work, you know, from here on out and own the company. How much value will he add versus how many profits will we give away? And that's their calculation to determining whether to hire another person, whether to, you know, increase the amount of labor they're putting into their, their recipe for production. And it's really the same for capital goods, too. If you can't rent out a tractor, you don't really know the rental price of a tractor. You don't know if a tractor in the summer is more valuable than a tractor in the winter, because you can just sell tractors, you can't really rent them out. So with a, you know, a three-month lease of a tractor in the summer, you don't know what that's worth. So maybe it makes sense for one farm to you know use its tractor at the beginning of the summer and then rent it to another farm. Uh, and for that you know, other farm to not use its tractor, a tractor in the beginning of the summer and then uh, you know rent a tractor out and this is how to how to best maximize production but without rent you know without being able to rent these things you simply uh, couldn't and you wouldn't even know that you were producing inefficiently since you wouldn't be able to calculate using rental prices in fact the you know the f it's really an absurd concept that we wouldn't have any rent right this is something that is uh, the norm. This is the norm of means of production in every society throughout history. Means of production have always, you know, been rented out. It's a common function in the market. There's always rental prices. There's always interest. There's always uh, wage labor. And this is just how humans naturally organize because this is the way to produce most efficiently. To fully use economic calculation to uh, produce the most we can given the fewest resources. And uh, you know, really. Our entire civilized life is because of production. Uh, so some anarcho-socialists say, "Well, yeah, maybe we won't have as many, you know, gadgets, but we'll be in a, you know, much better society." Well, you know, not having as many gadgets. Uh, this is this is the the hallmark of civilization. This is the hallmark of society. Child mortality, for instance. Uh, you know, how many premature babies die? How many children die before the age of three? You can you know correlate this with gadgetry, right? Uh, the capital stock determines all this. How much? Uh, how many machines are making that uh, child-saving medical device? How many machines are making that laptop? Which machines make those machines? Which machines make those machines? You have to have a whole whole built-up capital structure. As this capital structure grows, you both get you know better gadgets, and you get you know less famine. You get uh, lower child mortality rates. You get more leisure. Um, you don't have to work as much. Uh, so you want to produce as much as you can. Anarcho-socialism seems to be a very uh, poor method of production and uh, one that I don't think humans will voluntarily choose. Now, it could be, you know, occupancy and use property rights don't have to exist without the state, right? You could have the, uh, the state kind of divvying up occupancy and use property rights and forcing them and banning interest, like I mean, Sharia law bans interest, although they still kind of have interest, they just don't call it interest. Um, but, you know, if the state banned all these things, maybe. But that's not what the anarcho-socialists are talking about. They're talking about people voluntarily abolishing uh, any sort of uh, rental of anything. And I think it's a nonsensical philosophy. There's no economic reason they would. Um, you know, just think of the average worker in a firm. He is a... Uh, you know, if that firm goes bankrupt, he doesn't want to lose his life savings. So, you know, he probably doesn't have 100% of his life savings invested in that firm's stock. Uh, he, uh, you know, he has a, a 401k, a diverse portfolio. And uh, so if the firm goes bankrupt and he loses his job, he doesn't lose his savings as well. Um, this is how most people choose. Uh, the pension plan has kind of gone out of existence because of this fact. It just kind of... Uh, 
people realize that, oh, if you have a pension plan, the company goes bankrupt, if you're screwed, so four, 401ks and, you know, stock options, uh, people, people generally, they don't want to have their entire life's capital sunk, their entire life savings sunk into their job because companies go bankrupt all the time. This is just the natural order of things. You know, the candle stick maker company goes bankrupt and the light bulb comes out, yada, yada, yada. The average company exists for like 10 years. Um, and, you know, things are obviously going to be totally different without a state, but uh, you get why people do this, why people, you know, don't want to, if they lose their job, to also lose their life savings. And so they don't own their own means of production. It's a, it's a hedging mechanism. Uh, one other reason that uh, workers don't tend to own the means of production is that uh, there are specialized people at creating wealth, right? Um, someone who... Uh, there's a movie online about someone on, on Craigslist. He keeps on trading things on Craigslist, and he starts out with a pencil, and he ends up with a house, and he just trades the pencil for something else, and then trades that for something else. So, you know, uh, this person, is he adding value? Well, in every one of those trades, uh, the person who gave up something to him uh, did it voluntarily, so they thought he was adding value at every step of the way. Um, now, you could stand on the outside and say, no, he wasn't ad adding any value. He was just, uh, you know, finagling all these people. But I think the person actually engaging in the trade has a better, better grasp on the situation than you do. Certainly, they know what they value more than you do. So they obviously think it's worth doing or they wouldn't have traded. So yeah, people can, can accumulate wealth in this way by just trading things for things that are more valuable. And, and in the market, what this means is they put their money in a more profitable stock and not in less property, profitable stock. People who invest in non-profitable stock lose their money and, and don't really own much of the stock. So the stock tends to be owned by people who are good investors uh, who know how to trade and produce wealth. And so, you know, if an industry is very profitable, a lot of uh, skilled investors are going to start investing in that industry. And uh, what, what does profit mean? Profit means that consumers desire it and there's not, you know, a, a lot of it, right? Uh, you know, gold is very expensive. Um, if you, you know, have a gold mine, that can be pretty, pretty damn profitable. Uh, but, you know, if gold was something that could be just produced willy-nilly, like, uh, you know, pencils, where the resources weren't really the main driver of the cost, uh, you know, they'd be pretty cheap. It depends on scarcity, on supply and demand. And so what profit does is it uh, sinks up supply and demand. It leads to more investment in the areas where the profit margins are higher. If there's a very high profit in, say, the towing industry, if tow truck drivers are making, um, or tow truck owners are making a uh, 100% return on their investment, other people will look at that and say, well, hey, I need to invest in the tow truck industry. This is a windfall. And so there'll be more and more investment into that industry until there's so much competition, until the market's saturated, and until profit goes down uh, to levels where it's not so you know, such an amazing investment that everyone's investing there, you know, sooner or later gets saturated and there's still some investment, but you know, that's, that's the method for if there's a lot of profit, people flooding that industry. And conversely, if the profit uh, margin goes down, so it's not that profitable, people will leave the industry and there won't be as much investment. And of course the profit margin will then tend to creep up if there's not a lot of people investing in there, if they all abandon the industry, but consumers still desire the good. So, you know, the profit, Profit is like any other price. It depends on supply and demand. And uh, people who are best at forecasting profits and best at accumulating profits and best at uh, investing in profitable areas, these are, uh, you know, they got everything they have by trading. And so, uh, you know, by trading things, they, they produce this wealth that they're trading. You know, all, all this wealth that this rich person has in, in the market is produced by him. And, uh, you know, Kevin Carson and Roderick Long, you know, take issue with this and they say, well, no, it's just because of government handouts, uh, you know, but the fact is, you know, it's like a sports coach or a sports athlete making a lot of money. Um, <clears throat> you know, they, they organized this, uh, you know, they directed the play. Uh, so, you know, they, maybe they weren't acting or cleaning the toilets during the play, but without them, it wouldn't have happened. And that's the important thing is, you know, people are, uh, without these very skilled investors and people who know how to run businesses, uh, the, the very skilled investment wouldn't have been made, the business wouldn't have been run as well. And uh, so the, the wealth they have is the wealth they produce. They, 
gave up something they owned and didn't steal anything. In this in this situation of the market of an anarcho capitalist market, at least. Now, in, in today's situation, there's a, there are a lot of good criticisms of uh, you know people who jump to defend like Boeing too often, um, or jump to defend patents uh, sometimes because patents aren't really a market activity; it's a government monopoly. Um, or large land grants. Sometimes people are too willing to defend that who are ANCAPs. And, and the anarcho-socialists have some good points on this, and they uh, they really sometimes put out some interesting thought. But the problem is then they revert back to, uh, well, because the government creates these problems, um, a free society would mean there would be you know no rich people, uh, no profit, no rent. It, it's a false logical deduction. Um, and you know it's saying that uh, A is present and so is B, so A causes B. This is a correlational fallacy. Uh, correlation does not imply causation. Just because there's rich people with a state doesn't mean there won't be rich people without a state. Just because there's for-profit firms with a state doesn't mean there won't be for-profit firms uh, you know, without a state. And the anarcho-socialists uh, simply fail to, to see the economics of the situation. Uh, but, you know, at least the mutualists, which is really what I've been discussing so far, has been the mutualist school of anarcho-socialism, which is uh, really, I think, the most consistent supporters of occupancy and use. Uh, Proudhon was really kind of the early mutualist, even though he didn't describe him as one. Uh, he was an anarchist and anarcho-socialist. Uh, Benjamin Tucker was pretty much a mutualist. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of famous... Emma Goldman was really in the mutualist school. All these occupancy and use um, supporters in their philosophies, uh, they usually admitted that money should exist. And some of them really got the calculation problem. Like uh, Kevin Carson and Roderick Long, they both get the calculation problem. But they don't really apply it fully. And so they apply it to pretty much say that, yes, uh, money will exist without the state because we need it to calculate but they don't, you know, apply it to rental prices, and so, uh, you know, you run into this system where money's a naturally evolving phenomenon because prices are necessary. Well, uh, you know, yeah, money transactions involving rent are a natural phenomenon because rent prices are necessary. This is a, a corollary, just like you know, money transactions involving shoes are a necessary phenomenon because shoe prices are necessary. You know, it's just one aspect of the market, and the calculation problem applies to rent just like it applies to anything else. The anarcho-communists are kind of a different a different crowd. Um, some of them are just kind of communists, and they really want this all-centralized organization administering everything. Uh, some of them don't get the calculation problem, and they think you can have a fully decentralized uh, system without money. Um, and that's what they mean by anarcho-communism. You know, it's not really clear what Marx uh, what Marx meant when he his final version of communism after the state after a totalitarian state ruled for a couple hundred years, then we'd have communism, and he said there'd be no state. Um, but he he said we can't really predict what that looked like, so he didn't uh, he didn't really describe it much. And then he he also said that uh, you know you're using a bad logic if you ever try to point out the problems with uh, socialism because we can't predict what that looks like either because we're in bourgeoisie class consciousness and we're not we're not there yet. Uh, the you know so a, a lot of anarcho communists are just Marxists, right? They they take Marx's philosophy and say, yeah, we'll we'll take a totalitarian state and government intervention and the ten planks of the manifesto and that will abolish capitalism and rent and profit and interest and uh, you know then we'll get at something and that's going to be our end state. Um, although, you know, really, uh, if you don't have money, and I think some of the communists even realize this, you have to have central planning. There's only two ways to organize a society. You know, if someone in one, you know, Soviet, uh, and the Soviets were uh, tiny uh, cooperative farms that were kind of sovereign for a brief period in early Russian history, but, you know, if one Soviet wants a tractor, needs a tractor, and another Soviet has a spare tractor, um, well, you know, they could rent rent the tractor, but if rent's not allowed, uh, how are resources supposed to get allocated? Well, uh, a central planner could do it, um, especially with money. You know, how are, how are the uh, 
with Walter Block's example of pickle owning chicken wanter and a chicken wanting pickle owner. Uh, they have to find each other in order, you know, to trade. But money eliminates uh, this dual coincidence of wants problem. But uh, yeah, so you know, places that kind of started out as anarcho communisms that refused to use money, such as uh, Catalonia during the Spanish Civil War, uh, quickly became very centralized. Uh, the communists took over very quickly in Catalonia. Uh, Brian Kaplan has a great essay, The Anarcho Statists of Spain, talking about uh, anarcho communism, anarcho syndicalism, and that that region. Uh, anarcho syndicalism, I suppose, deserves its own special treatment because. Uh, it's kind of a union philosophy, so you know, uh, instead of uh, democratic control of the, each workplace by each um, you know group of workers in it, uh, maybe you know the plumber belongs to the plumbers union, and that's democratically decided, and you know the chef in the restaurant belongs to the chef's union, and that's you know if the union officials are democratically elected, and and the unions negotiate to uh, determine um, well prices if there's still money, but I guess determine how much everybody gets. Uh, so. That's anarcho syndicalism, and it, it's a. I think uh, Rudolf Rocker was the main famous figure in that, and uh, it's it's more of a tactic, I guess, uh, of ending the state as they think of. If the unions just became all powerful, we'd have anarcho syndicalism. Um, uh, but really, this is just a you know a government of unions. If if all the unions are all powerful, and you know no one's allowed to to work outside the union, and they get together and form this, uh, you know agreement where they ex exchange on mutually agreed to conditions uh you know this is a, a syndicalist government uh there's no such thing as a narco syndicalism it's a syndicalist government and uh this is what a narco syndicalism and a narco communism kind of would devolve into uh but a syndicalist government is also known as a fascist government uh, the, many anarcho-syndicalists claim to hate fascism, and they, they rant against it, but uh, Mussolini used the terms syndicalism and fascism interchangeably. Uh, fascism is really just syndicalism plus, plus an added element of nationalism, but you know, the whole idea is that each, uh, you know, each industry organizes and then gets together, and that's the government. Um, so you know, the government is composed of the, the metal industry and the, the tire industry. Uh, so you know, this, is, uh, this is syndicalism. And I think it's uh, extremely close to fascism. In fact, the fascists considered themselves to be really syndicalists. Uh, these syndicates, you know, uh, I'd, I'd call them crime syndicates, right? I mean, uh, you know, union, <laughs> union uh, busting workers or workers who choose to work outside the union, uh, you know, they're, they're violating the law if the unions are the government, I suppose. Um, you know, I've got a friend who's in the carpenters union. I think he does work outside of it sometimes, but... <laughs> Um, well, you know, the, the union, I guess, could, could shoot you or jail you for, for not joining um, or ostracize you and kick you out of society and not do any business. Uh, so, you know, it's a, that's anarcho-syndicalism. I think it's just the same as syndicalism. I mean, it's really uh, only superficially different from fascism. Um, anarcho-communism, again, you know, if, it, if there's no money, uh, it's going to be centrally organized. It's going to turn into communism, you know. The early Soviets were independent and kind of in a narco-communist situation for like a, you know, a little while. Um, but then, you know, since the food wasn't getting to the cities, the government, because uh, because the government kind of was weak at one point, but the food wasn't getting to the cities. You know, it could draft the workers from the cities to go out to the countryside and grab the food. It ended up just being communism, right? Um, a narco-communism plus division of labor equals communism, which Marx actually kind of understood because he criticized the early utopian communists uh, who wanted to you know shut themselves off and not involve themselves in the division of labor um, with, with people outside their commune and Marx criticized this and says no we need the division of labor you know this is what the, the capitalist philosophers have shown us that the division of labor is necessary uh, but the thing is you know we need uh, the state directing it and um, you know instead of all these autonomous communes and maybe he even got the fact that without money, you can't have autonomous communes, and that's why he was so, uh, you know, he didn't really want to talk about what happened when we had these 400 years of totalitarian states and arrived at anarcho-communism. He said we couldn't predict it. And also, um, you know, why he was so heavy in pushing for a totalitarian, you know, state, the 10 points of the Communist Manifesto and all that, uh, because, you know, he saw that you couldn't uh, just go straight to anarcho 
communism. Um, the division of labor would either disappear or just by de facto you'd have to have a state. So, you know, he, he pushed uh, statism. And um, obviously the infraction of the non-aggression principle, I think uh, we can agree, is a result of that. Uh, so, you know, why... Why is the non-aggression principle being violated by anarcho-socialism? Well, I mean, first of all, the non-aggression principle is commonly taken to include contracts, right? Uh, if I, you know, borrow your car on the condition that I'll return it tomorrow, then I run off with it, I've, I've stolen from you, um, I've broken the contract. Uh, and the situation really isn't any different if, uh, you know, I borrowed the car in exchange for Ten dollars, and I gave you ten dollars for that. You know, if I refuse to pay the ten dollars, if I refuse to pay the rent on the car, I'm stealing from you. And so, uh, you know, the situation is no different with apartments and such. Um, you know, rent for apartments, and then machinery. Yeah, obviously, if the contract's broken between the worker and the person who owns the machinery, the, the capitalist, I suppose. Although all workers are really capitalists who own their human capital. So, the. Um, the non-aggression principle really uh, dictates absentee property ownership just by the virtue of the fact that it includes contracts. And, you know, without absentee property, there are no contracts. Uh, it's just occupancy and use. Um, you know, you can't agree to do something for someone for a wage. You can't contract out your labor and agree to do something for someone in the future. You can't um, contract out your uh, property, your house. You know, you can't rent it out. Um, there's no contracts. And uh, I think this would be very damaging to society, first of all, because uh, contracts depend on trust. Trust is essential to contracts. A society of contracts is a society of trust, is a society of uh, uh, friendliness, of um, people who are on good terms with each other. This is the, the same philosophy as Bastiat's whole uh, when goods don't cross borders. Armies will, which actually isn't a real quote by him. Uh, the, the real quote by him was... Uh, like a barriers result in isolation. Isolation gives rise to hatred. Hatred gives rise to nationalism, and nationalism gives rise to invasion. I think I'm butchering that, but anyway, you know this whole philosophy that contracts, that trust, that long-term arrangements, um, you know, breed civility, whereas there really aren't these things in um, in the narco-socialism. A uh, few people can get joined together and form a a communally owned thing, but outside of that, there's no real permanent agreements in effect. And uh, and I think the non-aggression principle would be, um, it, it's a violation of the non-aggression principle to have occupancy and use. And furthermore, um, the non-aggression principle in terms of, uh, you know, things like not allowing rape and murder and such is better enforced uh, when there is absentee property and, and these contractual arrangements um, just because it's a society in which trust is the norm and trust is imperative um, and good relations and being on good terms with people is imperative. So um, one, so I've gone over narco-capitalism, gone over narco-socialism, the different varieties of it. There's mutualism, which is slightly saner. Um, and, and, you know, you can have uh, mu firms owned in a democratic manner in an anarcho-capitalism, and often that makes sense. Uh, often when there's not a lot of capital involved, that happens. Like, law firms are typically owned. Um, and, of course, the, uh, the, their secretaries aren't co-owners, but the, the three lawyers will get together and be co-owners. So I, I guess in, in, you know, uh, well, law, lawyers aren't really a good example for... <laughs> For the market, anyway. I mean, I suppose they, they'd still probably be lawyers without the state, but I suspect a lot fewer of them. And, uh, you know, sometimes uh, it does make sense to do occupancy and use. Um, obviously, if, uh, you know, you uh, you want to just do a, a quick thing with, uh, you know, hey, why don't we go, um, you know, go out hunting with a friend, maybe you split it in half versus one of you owning the gun and renting it out. You know, it's like on the small scale, occupancy and use happens all the time. We're not against occupancy and use uh, in terms of the occupier owning it. We're just against it being a general rule and that uh, absentee, you know, the opposite of occupancy and use ownership being illegal. So, uh, you know, 
anarcho-capitalism or anarcho-socialism, you know, occupancy and use ownership is legal in a society an anarcho-capitalist society. It's legal in a society which tolerates absentee property. But in an anarcho-socialism, in an occupancy and use society, um, there is no anarcho-capitalism. There's no absentee property tolerated because absentee uh, property simply, you know, uh, does not exist. I suppose, you know, this is enforced as, you know, if I rent out my car, um, the person I rent out my car to either will just be able to take off with it and society won't punish him. This is kind of the, I suppose, the Proudhon argument. Or uh, he'll return the car but not the money he exchanged. He agreed to pay me to rent it. You know, this is the Benjamin Tucker kind of soft uh, anarcho-socialism. But either way, you know, it's a, it's a violation of contract, but, you know, so what? Contracts don't exist in anarcho-socialism. Um, so really, you know, anarcho-capitalism is tolerant of anarcho-socialism in a physical sense. And anarcho-socialism is not tolerant of anarcho-capitalism in a physical sense. Um, so this whole argument of, well, the state will fall and we'll see which side wins out, well, uh, that's not really a fair argument because the anarcho-socialists are saying we're just going to use, you know, force to, you know, take the means of production um, and so we're not going to allow the means of production to be privately owned so we're not going to allow these two competing systems of worker owned and absentee owned means of production to see which one wins out no if, if we're really pushing for occupancy and use of property rights that means there is no absentee ownership uh, that means anyone who claims to be an absentee owner is stealing and uh, so you can't uh, see which one wins out in the market um, but uh, so now I'll go back and, and be a little fairer to some of the anarcho-socialist critiques of uh, vulgar libertarianism, I suppose, is what, what um, Kevin Carson called it. Uh, Kevin Carson, the mutualist. And uh, so some, um, some people kind of look at, say, uh, Boeing, for instance, or uh, probably better, IBM, and uh, they might say, okay, so... Uh, you know, aggressing against IBM is a violation of the non-aggression principle. You know, uh, stealing its property or something like that. It's just a private company. Like, uh, well, you know, if IBM was um, programming the the numbers, the barcodes used in the Holocaust, which uh, it's true, IBM was involved in that, uh, the German division. Um, you know, they're willingly doing this with their knowledge, you know, not like selling a gun to someone and that person going off and murdering someone, but me having no knowledge that that was going to happen, you know, but, but really if they're complicit in, um, in, you know, the state's tyrannizing, then the normal, hey, layoff private property isn't necessarily uh, true or good. Um, you know, if your town, uh, keeps the police department but outsources it to a private firm um that private firm if it taxes you is uh you know is aggressing just as the police department would have and so um sometimes this is very evident in things like very large land grants um where the state will give out you know a hundred square miles to some rich person and uh you know or maybe just politically collect connected person and not even you know uh have them pay for it uh, and also uh, feudalism. Um, so feudalism is kind of a cartel arrangement. Uh, so if the state, you know, gives out these large land grants, and then feudalism is a cartel arrangement in that you're not allowed to undercut other feudal lords. So there's rules. Uh, so the feudalism is really a set of rules that the feudal lords have to follow. They can't sell off their land is the primary rule. Um, and, as soon, and it's called entail. And then as soon as entail was lifted, uh, pretty much the feudal lords all sold off most of their land. And land, uh, you know, went away from being these 200 chunks of uh, square miles that some guy owned to being uh, what we more vision as the market with, um, you know, small houses that are individually owned and apartment complexes uh, without one person owning everything in kind of a, a king way. Uh, so, you know, as soon as entail was done away with, as soon as the feudal lords were released from these restrictions by um, the main government, the king, uh, they, they sold off their land and uh, it, it devolved to more of a market-oriented thing. And this is uh, true in the American West where large corporations were given grants. Uh, you know, the land, more or less, after a while, has entered more of the legitimate market, but... Uh, you can't make this argument for every single piece of land the state has granted out. 
Uh, very little land is ever actually homesteaded in Rothbard's conception to the point where someone homesteads it and then has, um, you know, has the unfettered uh, right to it, and that's how property arises. Now, property uh, typically throughout history has arisen, as Ludwig von Mises was better on this than Rothbard, I think, is he points out that uh, property does typically arise through large land grants by the government. Uh, now, Mises said, um, you know, over time, this uh, turns into a market system of property uh, because, you know, uh, it's kind of kind of the Cosian theorem, um, a little word. You know, however you originally divide property, it's going to go towards its most efficient uses. Uh, and so the most efficient use isn't one central planner, one guy owning all the property, and he's going, you know, and they're going to realize this and uh, the use will... Uh, be devolved um, through the market. So, you know, large property domains, if it's legal to break them up, if the state allows this, they do get broken up. And this is uh, how most of the property we arrive at today has arisen. But um, uh, this kind of begs the question, though, like, uh, you know, Ted Turner has been granted thousands of square miles by the federal government. Uh, if someone sets up and, you know, sets up a, a house on Ted Turner's land without his permission, uh, you know, is it the pro state? Is it the pro? liberty thing uh how do we organize that does ted turner then get to kick them off is that pro property rights does the person who's homesteading get to say hey this is my land i homesteaded it that's kind of more of a rothbardian theory and be nice if that were true um and if the state falls certainly i think a lot of these larger grants are going to uh, be done away with um now, I'm not necessarily saying homesteading theory is going to be strictly enforced, uh, and it's a very mucky kind of theory. How much does homesteading actually, um, you know, what do you have to do to homestead something? Uh, if I go around and pick berries on a mountain all day, have I homesteaded the mountain? Uh, so Ludwig von Mises kind of is more critical of Rothbard's homesteading theory. Um, uh, kind of the, the Bastiat theory, really, that first we had property, and then we got together and formed a government, um, and then they infringed on our property. Now, it's more like the government granted out large chunks of land, and then um, uh, gradually uh, that got divided and divided up because it makes no economic sense for one person to own all that land. They're not going to manage it very efficiently because of the calculation problem. You need to have uh, transactions and widespread ownership in order to have prices, and you need prices in order to calculate. Uh, so just naturally, the um, yeah, the land's going to get divided up. Uh, this is the opposite of kind of the socialist conception that if people are allowed to buy and sell things and you know rent things out, then sooner or later everyone will just grab what one person will grab all the wealth. Kind of the Marxist conception that uh, wealth will consolidate into one super firm, and then uh, well, then Marx said the people would have to overthrow it and take it over, but. That's not really how it happens um, because of the calculation problem. Now, there are economies of scale, and sometimes a lot of anarcho-socialists miss this, is they miss the fact that uh, maybe you know, they keep on trying to point out how they think Walmart is a creation of the state. Um, you know, would a Walmart without, exist without the state? I don't think any of us can know. I think Walmart suffers from the state just as much as it's helped out. In fact, I, I personally think more because uh, most towns refuse to let Walmart set up. Um, Walmart has to pay an enormous amount of taxes. Uh, they do pay tolls and shipping fees. Kevin Carson's main critique is they get to use the highways. They use the roads. They must be subsidized by the government. Um, kind of an unfair critique, I think, just because you use the roads doesn't mean you're subsidized by the government and a, a creature of the government. And also, they do pay for the roads, uh, and they pay a hell of a lot of taxes. But, you know, we, we can't really know. Would Walmart exist without the state? It's a, it's a question we can't fully answer. Uh, but economies of scale are definitely one of the reasons why Walmart exists today. Uh, and I don't think they're – obviously, no one thinks they fully exist because of the state. Or else it would just be like the DMV would be horrible customer service. It's some mix of this economy of scale providing things people want. Um, and – so pretty much economies of scale mean uh, kind of one good example is, say, human resources. Um, so, you know, if you're a company with uh, 20 people, maybe if you have one human resources agent. Uh, so if you can go up to 40 people then and double your profits, maybe you still only need one human resources agent. That's an economy of scale. Um, 
you know, as you expand, you uh, some of the costs are fixed, and so expansion means that you're able to achieve a better profit margin uh, because some of the costs are fixed or you don't expand as fast as the production expansion. The network effect is kind of uh, another factor in this Metcalf's law. Um, this is especially relevant in terms of money, uh, like the internet, Bitcoin, whereas the more uh, nodes you have, the more connections you have, the value of a network grows exponentially. So if it's a network, like a cell phone network owned by a cell phone company, uh, that's an economy of scale there. Now, diseconomies of scale are also important to think about. Um, the main diseconomy of scale is the calculation problem. Uh, you need uh, prices in order to calculate, so you're not going to be able to calculate if you own so much that uh, there's no prices internally. And many of the large firms today, uh, they realize this to some extent because they, uh, they're very, they try to mimic the market, um, kind of in the way that states sometimes try to. But you know, they try to mimic the market in that uh, they have as much local control as possible. It's usually franchises, the store, the individual store owners have uh, lots of control over the store. Uh, but then the larger companies set some policies, of course. And uh, so they try to decentralize things so there's more ownership and exchange. Uh, but of course, you know, if you have some policies and the profit taken by a large company is not full decentralization, but you know, they they tend towards this just because the calculation problem is always and everywhere kind of at the forefront of economic reasoning. Of course, it's, it's um, you know, human action that is uh, designs something but doesn't plan it. So you know, uh, or you could say, um, you know calculation through action but not design so people don't think like oh I want to be able to do math so I'm going to sell off some of my company it's just the fact that uh, you know they act to maximize profits the people who maximize profits the most end up with the most resources so the resources tend to be used in a profitable way and uh, the profitable way is to do things more efficiently and the way to do things more efficiently is to control costs and you can't no cost without the calculation and so in situations without calculation, it's very inefficient and, uh, you know, outside actors are able to come in and um, take over. So, you know, this balance between the economy of scale and the diseconomy of scale, uh, it determines the firm size, you know, how big the organizations are in the market. And this firm size um, might be rather large indeed. Uh, like Konkin's, uh, <laughs> you know, even in Konkin, who's kind of a socialist, uh, his agorist uh, society was this huge kind of firm that had a shopping mall um, and this existed without the state or uh, in a opposition to the state so it's um you know how big will companies be I don't think we can know but I do know that uh, we need to call our philosophy anarcho-capitalism anarcho-socialism is a nonsensical philosophy it doesn't take into account economics and uh, it's not consistent with the non-aggression principle and it's not very well thought out, I think. But we shouldn't forget that sometimes they make some good points uh, in terms of pointing out how not everything we call to be private today is really private. Uh, Kevin Carson's essay, The Subsidy of History, is probably a good um it, It's got some good historical facts. And, of course, the flaws. Then he says, well, occupancy and use is the answer, which I think is nonsensical. But uh, anyway... That, is, that has been my episode on anarcho-socialism. So thanks for tuning in. Uh, this has been Scholarly Sedition. This is your host, Andrew Grishon, and this is the Voluntary Virtues Radio Network.